it's time for an update on the pines and this is the first week of August 2023 and we're starting off with the Vanderwolf Pyramid this is labeled as Pinus flexilis which is a uh, white pine native to the western US although I've also seen that disputed and some say that it's Pinus strobiformis which is also native to the western US but either way, it seems to be doing good in Middle Tennessee. I have lost one in the past due to some sort of root problem. And actually this specimen we're looking at here is growing in a risky location because it's close to some known uh, funguses that can damage the roots. But so far so good. And of course it has a nice blue color, probably the bluest pine in my whole collection. Maybe one of the bluest pines you can find and they actually sell this at Lowe's, so it's very easy to get your hands on if you want to try a Vanderwolf Pyramid. This one has been in the ground maybe three or four years, four years probably, and it's continuing to put on about a foot of growth vertically every year, and it's fairly narrow in its spread as well. You can see most of the branches are upswept, kind of branching upward, but so far so good on the Vanderwolf Pyramid. Moving on. All right, next we have a pine that most of you won't actually be able to try, but I just want to show you. This is the spruce pine, Pinus glabra, native to the southern U.S. Usually grows in southern Alabama, southern Georgia, maybe northern Florida. And you would think, based on that native range, that it's not cold tolerant, but this tree did survive negative four without any problems. The only possible problem is that it's a little bit yellow in the needles, and I think it probably needs more acidity in the ground. So I may try to increase the acidity with some ironite next February. I don't want to put it on there now because I don't want it to start growing vigorously right before the cold weather arrives in a couple months. So we'll wait and see, but... I have three spruce pines and all three of them are doing pretty well. So if you can get your hands on Pinus glabra, I highly recommend it. Here's a small example of a Virginia pine. I mentioned this in another video, but it's doing well. Let me show you the larger one. Here's that larger Virginia pine, Pinus virginiana. And it's put on a lot of growth this summer. Probably vertically it may have gone up two or three feet getting tall. actually has three liters at the top. I need to trim one out. It has shorter needles. It's a vigorous grower. It's actually native to Middle Tennessee, Pinus virginiana. And you can find them on wilsonbrothersgardens.com if you want to try them. Surprisingly, even though it's one of the best um, trees you can grow here, it's not really found in local nurseries. Actually, that's not surprising. I need to do another video about why nurseries don't carry trees that grow well here. But the point is, if you want good growth in a pine, by the way, this is extremely drought tolerant. Um, if you want good growth, drought tolerance in a pine, you're gonna have to go online and get that mailed to you. But uh, if you do have a dry area, like a steep slope or something, south facing steep slope, and you think it's too dry to grow a fast growing evergreen, try the Virginia pine. Now, it may not grow as fast in those conditions. It actually grows too fast where I have it on this rich soil because it gets too much water, so I almost recommend it for the worst sites possible. Put this pine in there and it'll grow. It's extremely tough. Here's another pine that probably would do well on almost any site, and that is the pitch pine, Pinus rigida. Pinus rigida, yes, that's it. And uh, it's also native to East Tennessee, not Middle Tennessee, but it's growing well not as vigorously as the Virginia pine, but I recommend it if you can get it. Very hard to find online. Again, I don't know why, but it's a really cool pine. The needles obviously are a little bit longer than Virginia pine, but it probably has a lot of the same survivability characteristics as Virginia pine does. The biggest and fastest growing pine you can grow in Middle Tennessee is of course the Loblolly pine. And you probably see them growing on the side of the interstate highway. But uh, you can plant them in your yard as well. Also available online. 
On rare occasions you might find them at Walmart, but I haven't seen them in a long time. So I just order them online. Even Target sells them online. Home Depot does as well. Pinus Teta is the Latin name. And um, in some years past, the needles have been a little bit yellow tinged, but this year they're a nice deep green, as you can see, and basically flawless. And to add to that, the uh, Lobbelly Pine is the most fragrant of all the pines. Although I don't smell anything now, but at certain points in the year you can really smell the fragrance that comes from this pine, which is a nice, uh, a nice touch that increases its appeal. Oh, wow, look how dark green, even all the inner needles are completely dark green. So I think the extra rain this year has really helped the Lobbelly Pines. They actually um, are a pine that tolerates a little bit wetter than normal soil. So in contrast to the Virginia pine, which you could put on your worst dry spots, I would plant the Lobbelly pine on some level ground, maybe in a spot that's not waterlogged, but like it's a normal amount of rain. Every now and then maybe a little bit more normal rain. Try the Lobbelly pine there and it can probably do very well. Now here's an exotic pine that is not from North America. This is the Pinus parviflora, uh, Japanese white pine. You can see it's got short needles, bluish colored needles. I don't think it's as blue as the Vanderbilt Pyramid, but maybe it will be when it grows up. This is the Glauca cultivar of Pinus parviflora. And I've seen some nice large examples growing around here, so I know it will do well. Obviously cold tolerant, it was in the ground during the flash freeze of 2022. And this one came from conifercingdom.com. It is grafted at the bottom. As you can see, I don't know if it's possible to even buy par Pinus parviflora on its regular rootstock, but I'm told that it's grafted onto Pinus strobiformis, southwestern white pine. So planting a, a tree like this is really a uh, double experiment because I'm seeing how the top side handles things like uh, diplodia, tip light, and other things that attack the top side of the tree. And I'm also testing the roots of Pinus strobiformis to see how it handles any root pathogens. So it's a little bit of an experiment. And if you are in the mood to experiment, try an exotic pine. But if you want something that's going to be a sure grower, I would stick with the first four pines that I showed you. Um, the Lobbelly Pine, the Pitch Pine, the Virginia Pine, and the Spruce Pine. Also, if you can get your hands on Shortleaf Pine, I don't have one, but that's another native pine. Could be worth trying. And if anybody finds where to buy Table Mountain Pine, let me know, because I want to try that too. Realistically speaking, if you want to try a pine in Middle Tennessee, you're probably limited to two choices, which is Virginia Pine and Lobbelly. Unless you're into experimentation and it doesn't matter whether it lives or dies, then you can try something more like this Pinus parviflora. By the way, here's a close-up of the foliage on the Vanderwolf Pyramid. I don't know if you'd consider this an exotic pine since it is from the U.S., but it's from the western U.S., which is a whole other growing environment, so I would call it exotic to the southeast. It's also a little bit risky. I don't really know what the long-term prospects are. But it does look really cool and it grows a uh, pretty fast for a non-native pine. I am going to run a few experiments on pines here and here's one. This is the Japanese black pine, Pinus thunbergii. And this is the Thunderhead cultivar which is a little bit dwarf. And I just kind of picked this up at Lowe's just to see what it was like. I had a neighbor that was growing a few with moderate success. And I wanted to see what would happen if I tried to grow one. I put it in a spot that has pretty good drainage. It's kind of on a slope. And actually, um, it's been in the ground most of the season. And it's still growing at the candles. I don't even know if these needles are going to make it all the way out before the growing season ends. So we'll find out. This may be a failed experiment from the start. But um, be cautious when you're buying something like a pine at Lowe's, unless it's a native, because these exotic pines are always very risky. And here's my other experiment. This is a um, Pinus strobus, eastern white pine. 
And I've made several videos in the past about uh, why you should not plant this tree in Middle Tennessee because of uh, so much mortality we're seeing in this tree. Possibly for unexplained reasons, possibly root rot. Who knows, but um, why would I buy one? Well, I just want to do an experiment. I've got a spot on a, a slope, which I think is going to be good for the drainage. I think the roots need a lot of room. And it's uh, outside of my fence, so I need something that is deer resistant. And I know this will be deer resistant, this um, eastern white pine. This does grow native in Tennessee. Up in the uh, mountains of East Tennessee, you can find native eastern white pine growing. Again, the Latin name is Pinus strobus. So it's not uh, a real stretch to grow it here. You see it growing everywhere and growing vig vigorously, in fact. But I'm not putting it in a spot where I need it for long-term privacy. I'm going to put it somewhere where um, if it dies, it dies. I'll just replace it with something else. But these are lows now, uh, at least around here. You might be able to find the eastern white pine. Uh, look at this behind it. The dead skeleton of a failed experiment for the Coast Redwood. That was the Inman Select. It was billed as cold tolerant, but that wasn't taking into consideration the fact that the temperature can drop to negative four in one day. So obviously it died. And here you have the rusting hulk of a burned out grove of Leland cypresses, also badly damaged by the extreme cold. I'm not sure what I'm gonna do yet. So uh, compared to those two failures, Here's some good hope on the eastern white pine. Maybe we can do something with this. And for some bonus content, I wanted to show you um, what my evergreen collection looks like outside the fence here. I have a planting of three Perkii red cedars, which is a cultivar of our native eastern red cedar, that are kind of forming this monolithic wall of sea green colored foliage here. And Perkii is surprisingly hard to find, but grows very well, obviously, because it's native to this exact region. And here's my Cedrus Atlantica Blue Atlas Cedar right here. It was a little bit damaged by the cold, but it's come back to put on vigorous growth this summer, and I do recommend Blue Atlas Cedar on a spot with good drainage. And next to that is the Blue Ice Cultivar of Arizona Cypress. It also survived the cold unlike the Carolina Sapphire cultivar. Actually, if you look back there, between the Berkeley and the Atlantic, or sorry, the um, Blue Atlas Cedar, you can see the stump of a Carolina Sapphire that was cut down. And then next to that, a Virginia pine that I had to severely trim because it was growing too fast, got blown over by a windstorm. Oh, actually, I just noticed this. Check that out. Caterpillars completely eating all the foliage off my Virginia pine. I'll take care of that when I'm done filming the video. Behind that, the um, Japanese plum yew, Cephalotaxis harringtonia, is finally putting on some good vertical growth here on the leader. And here is the dead remains of the Cunninghamia lanceolata. And this species I talked about a lot in several videos and the trials and tribulations of attempting to grow it. And I'm somewhat relieved that that experiment has come to an end because it was completely killed by the frost when it dropped to a uh, negative four. So um, don't try Cunninghamia. And then of course I have the tragic tale of two more cryptomerias here that were growing strong and now they're completely dead because of the cold. And I've got this little Korean fir, Abies coriana, Silberlock cultivar. And here's another one of those spruce pines, Pinus glabra. Very strong grower. And then what I really wanted to show you was this humongous grove of loblollies here that have just continued to grow three to four to five feet a year vertically. You can see they're huge now, they must be Man, I don't even know how tall they are, 30, 35 in the tallest. And in front of them, a row of five completely dead Carolina sapphires that I haven't removed yet. For the only reason I haven't removed them is because I want them to continue to block the sun to that area underneath the loblollies, so I don't have to worry about weed growth. 
and I'll come in there and put in a thicker layer of pine straw mulch this fall. I may take these out fairly soon, but these are just left here for shade purposes. And then here is the Lebanese cedar. Mostly lost all of its foliage in the cold weather. One side branch seems to be doing well, but I, I'm going to take this out. Put something out there, put something else there. And here is the Japanese larch, Larix camphori, which continues to impress me with its vertical growth. As a reminder, it is deciduous. And next to that I have a very large specimen of the native eastern red cedar that was transplanted from a local forest. And its growth is just insanely vigorous at all times. I don't do anything. I don't water it. I just set it and forget it. The only problem is I do need to come in and trim out a lot of the side branches to lighten the load because this species is susceptible to ice damage if it's not um, properly balanced. So watch out for that. And then of course the uh, Dawn Redwood doing very well and the bald cypress there. And this is a um, pond cypress here, Texodium ascendens. And then uh, this is a small Abies firma, Japanese fir, which was damaged by um, the cold a little bit, and then especially damaged by a late frost that killed almost all the new growth. And you can see there's a little bit of um, secondary growth here, very small amount. And then similar story for this Li Jiang spruce, which lost most of its growth this year, but it came back a lot stronger than the fir did. So that's a small Li Jiang spruce coming back. And then the smallest of all is this little guy down here. This is the uh, golden larch, Pseudolaryx amabilis. Extremely hard to find, but I'm not expending an inordinate amount of energy to maintain it because it's insanely slow growing and it's hardly changed at all since I put it in the ground two years ago. So even though um, it may seem tempting to go on a epic quest to find the golden larch, there's no payoff because it doesn't grow that well around here as far as I can tell. And the last thing I'll show you outside the fence is this collection of two Norway spruces that are growing insanely well. And one curiosity, the um, tips of this Norway spruce, I guess, had some secondary bud break. I don't know why, if it's the humidity or the excess rain this year or whatever, but you can see there's almost this little pom-pom effect on the ends of some of these things. And up top even where the, the buds that were ready for next spring broke bud early and then reset new buds for next spring. So odd, but not unexpected because Norway spruce is extremely variable in its forms. So this is a strange one right here. Here's a more classic one. Perfectly conif uh, conical shape. And even though it's behind these Berkey eyes, it's growing just fine because Norway is a relatively shade tolerant. So um, Norway spruce, Picea abies, another great species for Middle Tennessee.